Welcome everyone. My name is Anmol Krishnan Sachdeva. Hope you all are enjoying KubeCon. Today I'll be talking about managing container lifecycle correctly. Before moving forward, let me introduce myself. I'm a site reliability engineer and currently I'm working at the Wilix Group. I'm an international tech speaker, a distinguished guest lecturer, and also I have represented India at reputed international hackathons. I love doing research in the field of deep learning and computational neuroscience and have eight plus publications to my account. I describe myself as an all-stack developer, that is a person who is capable of designing and developing solutions for platforms like web, mobile, desktop, and embedded systems. Apart from that, I also like mentoring people. Now let's have a look at the OLX Group. OLX Group is a global product and tech group consisting of 20 plus brands. We are an online buying, selling, and exchange platform serving approximately 350 million people per month. And also we are present in around 45 countries across the five continents. We have more than 10 million online listings every single month, and we have billions of widgets per day. Also, we have hundreds of thousands of cash reads per second, and all of this is backed by hundreds of microservices that we run in our Kubernetes clusters. That's fantastic. Let's have a look at the infrastructure landscape. Mostly the tools and platforms that we use at OLX belong to the CNCF landscape. I'll not be drilling down into details of this. Let's have a look at the agenda of today's talk. Today's talk is divided into six segments. The first segment is about Unix processes and init systems. We'll be talking about zombies and orphans also in this section. The next se uh, section is about managed lifecycle. Here we'll be talking about pod and container lifecycle along with Linux signal handling. The third section talks about resiliency and high availability through health checks and probes. Specifically, we'll be talking about liveness probe, readiness probe, and startup probe. The fourth segment is about lifecycle hooks and graceful termination of pod. We're going down into deep detail of how graceful termination happens. The fifth section is all about init containers and its detailed working. The sixth uh, segment is about init container, uh, the comparison between init container, startup probe, and the post startup. So let's get started. In this section, we'll be discussing about processes and init systems. We'll also be talking about zombies and orphans and how to deal with them inside the containers. So just to give you an overview of what Unix processes are, a Unix process is basically an instance of a running application, and the processes are ordered in form of a tree. Each process can spawn several child processes. We can see on the left-hand side, there's a process, the topmost process, which is called as the init process or the PID1 process. It is a process which is started by the kernel at the time of boot, and it takes care of spinning the rest of the system processes. We can see that PID1 or the init process is the main process. It has two children. One is PID2 running SSHD, and one is PID3 running Nginx. PID2 further has created another process, which is PID4, and is running Bash. Let's have a look at zombies. So what are zombies? Suppose a process is there. Consider PID4 in our case. And this process has terminated. Once the process has terminated, it is referred to as defunct or zombie process. What a zombie process basically means, it's a process which has terminated but has not been waited for by its parent. Now, what means by waited for? Waited for basically means that the parent actually waits for the child to return its exit code or the exit status so that the parent can actually release the resources that it is holding. And this process is often called as reaping. So basically parent triggers wait PID system call here. The flow is that there is a sick child signal which the child process when terminating generates. The sick child signal is sent to the parent process ID, and then the parent actually calls this wait PID system call. Once this wait PID system call is triggered, the reaping starts. So in nutshell, zombies are the processes that have terminated but have not yet been waited for by their parent processes. Now what happens if a process loses its parent? Consider in our case PID4, which is a child process of PID2, but PID2 has somehow got terminated. From now onwards, PID4 will be called as orphan process because it doesn't have any parent. In Unix systems, PID1 is responsible for reparenting the child to itself. So PID4 will now become child of PID1 because PID1 will reparent PID4. With this, we wrap up our overview of zombies and orphans. Now let's see how zombies are harmful. For each zombie process, there's an entry in the process table, and zombie processes keep on acquiring the kernel resources, though in a minimal fashion. If the number of zombie processes is high, then the creation of new processes may not be possible because resource starvation may be there. 
having zombies inside the containers also poses some challenges generally one main application process runs per container and it is treated as prd1 so whatever we specify in the entry point of the container is treated as prd1 now say we have coded an application to solve a specific purpose this is not meant to suffice in unit systems functionalities what if there are many zombies getting created our process will not be able to read them then also if we are using some third party managed docker containers we are not sure whether they are actually having the process being treated as an init process or not whether they have the functionality of an init system or not so this also poses some challenges there comes a need of having a proper init system in our containers now sometimes people use bash but the thing is that bash is able to perform some of the reaping functions but is not able to handle the signals properly is not able to pass the signals which it receives from the operating system to the child processes now let's talk about some sophisticated init systems upstart and system d are two options but these are heavyweight systems we have tiny and dumb in it these are lightweight systems so we'll be taking into account tiny in this talk tiny is an init system which is an open source system and it's suitable for docker containers and also it's suitable for production environments it's simple and lightweight it also reaps zombies and does the signal forwarding properly adding or removing tiny doesn't have any negative impact so let's not wait and get started with setting up tiny setting up tiny is pretty straightforward on the left hand side you see a code snippet this is a docker file the first four lines actually are the contents of a docker file which contains the command to run a python program inside a docker container line 7 to 13 are relevant for us so we will be focusing on them we just need to specify version of tiny and the remote url from where we can fetch the release then we just set the permission of this binary and then we provide the entry point entry point can be provided as tiny followed by two hyphens then we just need to supply a regular command like we did before now this defunct.py which is a program that i want to run inside the container its content are on the right hand side this program actually shows how zombies are created and how orphans are reaped so we'll be having a quick look in the next time so let's look at the configuration of the pod resources for both of them one is for the version which doesn't contain tiny the first one which is tiny disabled yaml the second one is for the one which contains tiny in it it's a simple python script that i showed which will be running in both of them the first one should show defunct processes and the second one should not show defunct processes because the parent should be able to read them now let me run both of them so we see at the top that the two containers are running and since these are short lived containers they will be just going into crash loopback and then restarting themselves let me print the logs for both of them so you will see the difference the first one actually shows the process as defunct process and it's also labeling the pid8 as zombie process the second one also shows that pid8 will be zombie process but it actually reaps the zombie process so we are not having any defunct label like we had in the first case so using tiny actually reaps the zombie processes this is a simple example which shows the same so let's discuss more details on tiny before moving forward this is a script which i used for creating the zombies you can have a look here okay so more details uh, so tiny needs to run as pid1 in order to reap zombies and if it is not able to run as pid1 it also has a provision to be run as a sub reaper so who is a sub reaper sub reaper is any process which is not running as pid1 but can actually perform the function of reaping so tiny can do it pretty simply just need to pass another argument so it is hyphen s so it looks like tiny hyphen s followed by double hyphens and the special thing about tiny is that it exits with the child's exit code and remapping is also possible so if you want to remap some say exit code to something else we can do that with tiny this wraps up the section of zombies orphans and tiny system let's move on with the managed life cycle till now we have understood how processes work in containers and how to manage them through init systems now we'll be discussing about the life cycle of container and box there are five distinct phases of a box life cycle these are pending running unknown succeeded and failed Pending state means that the pod has been created through the API and is waiting for some node to get scheduled on. 
The running state means that the pod is operational and is running fine. Unknown state is a rare occurrence and it means that the Kubernetes cluster has some internal problem due to which it is unable to communicate with the pod. Then comes the last two states. These are often found when we use cron jobs. One is succeeded, which means that the pod has finished normally. The other one is failed, which means the pod has crashed. Kubernetes also watches the state of all the containers and containers have three states in their life cycle. The first one is waiting, the second one is running, the third one is terminated. Waiting state means that the container is performing some operations which are required before the startup. It may be pulling images or applying secrets. Running means that it is running without any issues and terminated means it may have suffered some failure or it may have succeeded. To know about the exact reason for termination of the container, one may use the queue control describe pod command. Now let's talk about something really important, the graceful termination process. When talking about an application's performance and behavior, one thing to consider is that whether the application handles the termination process gracefully or not. By handling the termination process gracefully, it means whether any cleanups are required or not. Before terminating, there may be some need of cleaning up files. There may be some need of cleaning up the resources, maybe releasing some connections, making transactional commits. And if not done, this may impact the performance of the application and this may impact the users also. Forced terminations are a big threat. Forced terminations could often lead to degraded performance or even some downtimes. The outage may be there because the application may have ended up in an improper state because of the forceful termination. Now let's talk about the two important Linux signals that form the part of the pod termination process, sigterm and sigkill. Sigterm can be considered as a gentle poke to the container to cause termination of the processes. It doesn't cause any immediate termination and this signal can be handled or even ignored. On the other hand, Sick kill is like a hard kill. It's analogous to the kill hyphen line command that we use to kill the processes. This cannot be handled and it's like cutting the power of the machine. Now let's talk about the termination life cycle. First, the grace period is set and the default is 30 seconds. Here the pod enters the terminating state and stops getting any sort of traffic. Next is the execution of pre-stop hook if it exists and we will cover the details of this in a bit. Then comes the sick term signal, which is sent to PID one of each container there, that is there in the pod. Here comes the role of the init system and signal handling that we talked about earlier today. If one is using an init system, and uh, then it can be ensured that proper system forwarding is happening. However, it still depends on the application whether it can handle the signal or not. We'll discuss about this and how to deal with such situations shortly. Then comes the fourth stage. It is when the grace period ends and the uh, sick kill is actually issued. Then the API server deletes the pod's API object and finally the pod terminates. Let's analyze the termination lifecycle through a time series graph. Suppose the pod enters the terminating state here and stops receiving any sort of traffic. Grace period is set and the pre-stop hook starts executing. Say the hook got executed by this point, then sick term signal is issued to all the containers in the pod. Once the grace period ends, Sick kill is issued and the pod forcibly shuts down. This is the complete termination life cycle. All right, so now is the time to learn about achieving resiliency and high availability through the use of health checks and probes. Let us understand the health probe pattern first and its need. Kubernetes should know the state of the pod so that it can decide whether to send the request to the pod or not. All of this becomes easy if the container exposes some APIs for different kinds of health checks. Kubernetes containers are self-healing entities. There is a component called the kubelet which runs on each node and is responsible for bringing up the containers and keeping them running. The kubelet even restarts the containers in case if there is any crash. This is done by doing generic health checks against the containers and it is called the process health check. A container's main process can crash due to numerous reasons like seg faults can happen or some unknown bug may be there. In such situations, the health checks help a lot. Let us look at some more problems in detail. What if an application stops working without its main process crashing? It's not weird and it's common. Deadlocks, memory leaks, infinite loops, thrashing, and many other reasons may be there. Applications should be able to handle some of the mentioned problems by using some complex logic. However, there needs to be some sophisticated, reliable, and an easier way to tackle such problems. Other services should not be seen sending requests to crash applications. So let's see and discover some of the effective ways to tackle such problems. Probes offer solutions to such problems. A probe is basically a diagnostic performed by the kubelet on the containers in a periodic fashion. It helps in achieving resiliency 
and also helps in better load balancing and routing of traffic. Since the ports which are not ready to receive the traffic because maybe their containers are unhealthy, will have either their containers restarted or the traffic will not be sent to them. This will also ensure timely response to the requests. Now let's look at some technicalities of probes. Probing is basically possible via calling handlers implemented by the containers. And there are three types of handlers, exec, TCP, and HTTP. Exec is the one which executes some code and expects exit code zero. TCP socket check is performed by a TCP check against the specified port. HTTP get request is also possible on a specified IP port combination along with the path. It expects a response code in the range of 200 to 399. The resultant states can be success, failure, or unknown. Now coming to the probes, there are three types of probes that we will be covering. One is liveness, one is readiness probe, and other one is startup probe. Talking about the liveness probe, it helps in identifying whether the container is alive or dead. In case a failure is observed in the liveness probe, the kubelet kills the container and then restarts it. Whether the container will restart actually or not depends on the restart policy of the container, which can be always, never, or on failure. We will see the implementation of liveness probe shortly. Before moving forward, let me give you some tips. First one is that always define a liveness probe for ports running in production. It is really important. Second is have the application expose a health check API in the format of say slash health or something like that. The health check API should not require any kind of authentication else the probe will always fail. This is a point that should be noted. Then keep it light on computational resources. Don't put much complex logic uh, in the liveness probe section. Probe CPU time is part of the container CPU time quota. So you should not be putting any kind of complex logic in the liveness probe. Before moving forward with the demo, I would first like to cover the concept of readiness probe. A readiness probe signals whether a container is ready to accept new connections or not. Say during the startup, some warm-up procedure is to be followed, and this may take some time. So the container can actually delay sending requests to the pod using the readiness probe. Another use case can be to stop sending requests to the pod when the container is actually overloaded. It must be noted that until all the containers are ready for a pod, the pod isn't treated to be ready. Unlike liveness probe, on failure in readiness probe, a container isn't killed. It should also be noted that after receiving a sit-down signal, say, even though if the readiness check passes, Kubernetes tries not to send new requests to the container. Now let us understand how to use liveness and readiness probes in Kubernetes using a code. For demonstrating the usefulness of liveness and readiness probe, I have built a small yet powerful application powered by Flask that will help in understanding the probes easily. On the left hand side, you see that there is a snippet from the pod resource manifest which shows the usage of liveness and readiness probes. On the right hand side, you see a snippet from the Flask application, which shows some APIs and routing logic. So let's look at the pod manifest first. So here inside the container, you have the regular image, image policy and name. Then you see two new sections starting at 10 and 17. So liveness probe and readiness probe. Liveness probe and readiness probe, both in this example are using the HTTP get uh, probing mechanism. And they have uh, the path set to health live and health ready respectively. And the port is 5000 because 5000 is the port on which my Flask application is running. There are three new terms which you can see, initial delay seconds, failure threshold, and period, uh, period seconds. So initial delay seconds is basically the time by which we have to delay the probe. So the probe will start after two seconds of the start of container in this case. And likewise, the readiness probe will start after two seconds of the container. Uh, so basically, there will be a delay of two seconds uh, and then uh, the probes will start working. You can have different uh, values, in, uh, liveness and readiness probe respectively. Then we have failure threshold. Failure threshold specifies how many times the probe is allowed to fail. And in my case, I have specified as two and two in both. Then period seconds basically sets the periodicity or the frequency after which the uh, probe should hit again the application. So it's two seconds in our case. Now coming to the application code, uh, this is just a snippet and the application code is a bit huge. Uh, it actually has different routes. So health ready is one, health ready st uh, stop ready is there, health start ready is there. Health ready basically tells whether the pod is ready or not. Just it prints something uh, and then gives 200 uh, as the code if the pod is ready. It prints uh, the pod is not ready and gives 502 code uh, if, if the pod is actually not ready. So I'm just 
uh, implementing a naive logic here uh, in which when I hit health stop ready, then it actually turns the pod ready uh, variable to one. And when it finds in health ready state, uh, when it finds that pod ready is not equal to uh, zero, then it actually treats the pod as not ready. Likewise, uh, I set pod ready to be equal to zero here in health start ready. And uh, we can play around this uh, in the demo. Uh, so let's have a look at the demo. So just for a quick demo, here's the file, here's the pod manifest file, which contains the liveness probe and readiness probe sections ex as explained in the slides. So let's apply this uh, YAML and see how the pods react. So you'll see the pods are coming. Uh, so basically there's only one pod. Uh, so Python health is the name of the pod. So I'll just start tailing the logs. So you see uh, live and ready. These two are the APIs which are getting hit. And these are basically the hits coming from the probes. So you see live ready, live ready. This will keep on continuing. Uh, now let me go to the browser and show you uh, how the app looks like. Uh, so I haven't started the uh, port forwarding. So let me start the port forwarding for this. Let me forward it to 8989. Now I have started the port forwarding. Let me hit 8989 and I should see some response. Hello from Python. Now let me try and hit here uh, health live and it should hopefully give me the pod is live, right? Uh, I'll hit it multiple times and also just so that you can see the response code, let me open the network console. So it's giving me 200, again 200, okay. Now let's try with ready. Okay, uh, so we see that here we are always getting 200 as a response. Now, let me do one thing. Let me stop the readiness. Before hitting enter, uh, just see that here we are having 1-1 one, one as the ready state. So 1-1 one, one running here as the ready state. And here we are having 200 as the response for ready, health ready. Now, let me uh, hit on stop and uh, I got pod uh, ready has been stopped. Now let me hit on ready again. And it's giving me 502 as expected. Let's uh, see uh, these, these purple colored uh, lines. These are basically the lines when the readiness probe started failing and the pod has gone into zero one state. Now let me resume the uh, readiness state for this by hitting the API again. So start ready should actually do and then if I hit ready again, I'm able to see the pod in running state. So see the purple lines have gone. So the pod has again become ready. So basically what I did was I failed the readiness probe so that the traffic doesn't get routed to my pod. Now we'll see what happens when I stop the liveness probe, uh, as in I failed the liveness probe. So I have done this and it should actually kill the pod kill uh, the container basically, not the pod. So you see, uh, you were getting purple lined uh, healthy uh, health life. And now the pod must be, uh, the container must be serving its uh, graceful period. And shortly we should see a restart happening here. And uh, what we can do is simultaneously, we can see the describe output of uh, the pods here. So you see liveness probe failed. 502 and then you can see the restart count also bumped five. so that's all for the demo for the liveness probe and readiness probe uh, let's get back to the slides and uh, start with the next section so before moving forward with the next section we need to discuss about startup probe also so startup probe is basically a probe which indicates whether the application within the container has started or not all the other probes are disabled until the startup probe su succeeds and also it is mainly used with slow starting containers. We use a decent failure threshold uh, with startup probe, uh, probes generally, maybe say 10 or 15. And it is meant to be executed at a startup only, unlike others which run periodically. It may share the same uh, probing mechanism uh, as that of liveness probe and readiness probe. And in case of HTTP get method, they all, all the three of them can use the same path also. But the behavior of the three probes is different. 
Uh, let's quickly have a look at the lifecycle hooks. Lifecycle hooks are actually required for managing the container lifecycle in a better manner, since only signal handling is not the thing which we need to worry about. So there are two lifecycle hooks available. One is post start and one is pre start. Post start hook is actually executed just after the container starts and it runs parallelly with the main container. It can be used to implement some warm up logic or maybe a signal uh, to an external listener about the application getting started. Also, it can be used to do some preconditional checks. It must be noted that there are no guarantees of the post start hook running. And also, it uh, makes the container stay in the waiting state till it has executed fully and keeps the pod in pending state. It may also happen that the hook gets executed fully even before the main process has started fully. And in case of any failure, no retries happen, the container restarts depending on the restart policy of the container. Now, talking about the pre-stop hook, it's a call that is sent to the container before it is terminated and it triggers the graceful termination process. So basically it is used to execute some uh, graceful termination logic, either outside the application or by hitting some application endpoint, which can be triggered, to, uh, which can trigger actually the graceful termination of the app. In case of third party managed containers also, this comes handy. We at OLX are using pre-stop hook heavily. And uh, to quote an example, we have a chat server powered by Azure Bird and it uses the pre-stop hook to clean up the Redis connections and uh, entries on termination of the Azure Bird pod. And let's revisit the termination lifecycle graph and see where the pre-stop hook fits in. So as you can see here, the pre-stop hook is actually immediately called as the grace period starts and uh, it ends before the sick term signal uh, actually starts. So it can be used to handle graceful termination effectively. And uh, even for the cases where the application don't implicitly support graceful termination, this can be used to have uh, the graceful termination done for those applications. Now let's quickly see how these hooks can be implemented in Kubernetes. So here is the snippet of the code. Uh, I'm actually adding a line uh, in both the hooks to index.html of Nginx. So I'm using Nginx image. Uh, line nine actually states the lifecycle uh, section. And inside that we have post start and pre stop. Then we have a command uh, here specified for post stop and pre stop respectively. In pre-stop, I'm doing additionally the prenup of Nginx after uh, the hook actually executes. So let me apply the configuration now. This will take 20 seconds as I have specified this in uh, the post start hooks command. Okay, so it has started running. Let me port forward it and then let me try and open here. So you see post start. Now let me uh, delete this. And uh, we'll see pre-stop has here uh, started coming here. And uh, the pod is now serving its graceful termination period. And also, it must have uh, cleaned the Nginx uh, process. All right, now is the time to discuss about the init containers. So init containers are specialized containers that run before the application containers run. And that also means that they are separate from the application containers and run on separate images. These may contain some setup which is not present in the main application image and multiple init containers can run inside a pod and almost run successfully and sequentially in the specified order in the manifest. Also, the init, init containers don't support any sort of hooks or probes that we have seen so far. In case if there is any failure which init containers encounters, it depends on the pod's restart policy whether to restart the init container or not. If it is set to always, then it will always restart. Also, init containers can share the same volumes as that of the application containers. And altering any kind of code in the init container leads to restarting of the pod. Let us now see how to implement init containers in Kubernetes. Here I'm using an Nginx container, uh, which is an application container, and a busybox container, which is the init container. Both are using the same empty directory volume. The init container just modifies the index file of the Nginx container. And let's see how it happens. So let me apply the manifest. The pod has started initializing. You can see init 0 of 1. That means one container, inner container is there, out of which zero has been initialized. Now the pod is coming to the start state. It's initializing basically. And this, it's running. Let's go to Nginx uh, and see what it is displaying. It is displaying hello world from init container. So this shows that init container was able to modify in the uh, Nginx index.html file. Now, since we have seen how the init container works, let's see at the usage of init containers. Inert containers can be used for delaying the application container startup or can be used to perform precondition checks. They can also be used to run utilities or code that is not part of the application container. They can be used to seek data in database before the application start. Even it can be run to uh, it can be run to configure things at the runtime and wait for something to uh, become available. Maybe a DB, uh, uh, maybe a service that that needs to be available. 
before our application starts. We can also perform database schema migrations and, uh, and also prepare the schema. And it can also be used to create user accounts. So several use cases are there wherein we can use the init containers. Now let's get started with the scheduling and uh, resources of init containers. So init containers and application containers coexist inside a pod, and the effective request or limit for a, a resource of pod depends on uh, what we specify for both init containers and the application containers. So the effective request limit for a pod's resource is the higher of the sum of request limit for a resource of all the application containers that are present and the effective request limit for a resource of the init containers wherein the effective request limit for a resource of the init containers is the highest of any particular resource request limit that is defined on all the init containers. With this, we wrap up our section and we move on with the face off. So this is the comparison between init containers, startup probe and post start hook. So first let's set the parameters uh, based on the container. So yeah, post start hook can be used inside the same container as well as startup uh, probe can be used inside the same container. Uh, but init container requires a separate container. So application container is different and init container is different. Then the scope. So uh, scope of post start hook is limited to a container. Likewise, uh, scope of the startup probe is limited to a container. While the init container scope is not restricted to a container, but to the whole pod. So init containers are bound to the pod and not some particular application container. Now running the container image. Uh, so init container has the freedom to run the same or separate image but the post start hook and startup probe don't have this privilege. So they run on the same uh, image as that of the application because they are running inside the same container. Then run guarantees. So post start hook has no guarantee at all and the rest of the two must uh, run successfully in order to uh, proceed forward. Then talking about the failure thresholds and restarts. So startup probe uh, can have uh, the threshold specified and those should be decent in number, should be a bit higher than what we specify for liveness probe and readiness probe. For post start hooks, uh, we don't have any threshold, but restarts happen depending on the pod's restart policy. Uh, and uh, for the init containers, uh, restart actually happens again depending on the pod's restart policy. And in case uh, the post start hook actually fails, then the container fails and the container actually restarts and retries. Usage, so usage is almost similar, uh, but the, the distinct things I'll mention here. So post start is generally used to uh, signal the external listeners that uh, my application is going to start now, or maybe it can be used for preconditional checks and uh, maybe introducing some delays. Uh, specifically, init containers I have covered separately. Uh, so this can be used for various initialization purposes. And for startup probes, uh, it is appropriate for slow starting containers. Uh, and we must be specifying some uh, huge number in the failure threshold. Uh, last is the count. So init containers uh, can be multiple in number. So we can have 10 init containers depending on say our needs, but post start hook can be one. Uh, and uh, we can choose uh, between the uh, mechanisms that are present for the, the post start hook. Likewise, uh, there can be only one startup probe and uh, we can choose with, uh, between the different mechanisms for probing. Thanks a lot for uh, joining this talk. Uh, uh, now it's the time for QA. Uh, it's a bit late only. Uh, we are left with almost two minutes or so. So we can join in Slack uh, at this channel, uh, 2 kubecon 101 uh, Hope you enjoyed the conference and uh, hope you enjoyed my talk also. See you in the Slack channel now.